Okay. All right. Well, why don't I go ahead and get started because it's four o'clock. Is that okay? Sounds good. Okay. So in, in case anybody doesn't know me, my name is Patty Amadio and I'm a family physician. Um, and I, but I mostly teach being the course director for doctoring two and recently as of last, well, almost a year now, uh, the grievance officer for Quill. So I was asked to give a talk on uh, medical student mistreatment, a how-to manual, just kidding. Um, so <laughs> the objectives um, are going to be, we're going to talk about what, it, what are, mis what, how does Quillen define mistreatment and harassment, what's its impact a, a little bit, um, what kinds of student mistreatment have we, are we aware of seeing at Quillen, and what are the different pathways for reporting it, and what are your responsibilities in that regard. I don't have anything to disclose. Um, so the Quillen definition is the improper use or handling of an individual. Um, I was thinking that handling might mean, like if you're handling an individual, you're probably in trouble already. But, but then I thought about being an Italian, how many students I've given a hug to, though I have started, um, have, have started asking first. Um, and I sometimes refer to it as Bidening. But um, the, but even then, you know, with the asking first, like it might be kind of awkward to say, no, you can't hug me. So I have to probably rethink that. I don't know. But anyway, the definition is improper use or handling. And, and the results as described in the Quillen policy and as documented by data are um, mistreatment and le leads to burnout. It leads to the development of cynicism, which is a symptom of burnout, uh, as we talked more about in the previous learning um, uh, faculty development thing on the learning environment. Um, it interferes with students learning so they get in a place of being having been experiencing the effects of the mistreatment and it actually interferes with their ability to integrate knowledge many or some end up a lot of people end up considering leaving med med medical training and some do and it just kind of creates its adverse effect on the learning environment this atmosphere of that abusive behavior, harassing behavior is okay. And um, it, it, when it's unquestioned, it just keeps going. Some examples of mistreatment would be um, verbal attacks, insulting students, humiliating them, saying things that are belittling. Um, you don't, you, it's a wonder you ever got into this school, how you don't belong here using really harsh language or, or foul language towards a student, like cursing them out, um, threatening to harm them or actually harming them, um, requiring personal services like making coffee or something, or threatening them with a poor grade or poor evaluation for some other reason than that their academic performance. Um, harassment is, is along the same lines, but perhaps more, more pronounced, that it's un defined as unnecessarily harmful, injurious, or offensive treatment inflicted by somebody on another. It's something that um, would create an adverse experience. And I have a, the, this uh, reference in the slide. This definition comes from this paper, the impact on students of adverse experiences during medical school. And um, these are some of the, ad what they call, what they define as adverse experiences in the paper that um, humiliation and verbal abuse, public undermining and discrediting, bullying and intimidation, sexual harassment, threats of harm and racial discrimination. Um, sexual harassment is actually sort of a, just a subtype of other, of student mistreatment, which is um, in addition to being against Quillen policy is also, also actually illegal according to federal law. And um, it's, a, it's a specific subtype that must be reported. If you become aware of, witness, um, hear about um, credible complaint of sexual harassment, this must be reported um, to the grievance officer and then to the main campus compliance office. And we'll talk more about the reporting pathways in a bit. Um, 
the Quillen definition of sexual harassment is unwelcome sexual advances. And you have to think about that one person, as we might have seen in like the Harvey Weinstein trial and stuff like that, one person thinks whatever it is is welcome, right? And so, but it, it might be hard for somebody if there's a big inequity in the power differential involved, um, they may not be right that it, it is not welcome, but the person's having a hard time with being able to um, feel okay about resisting. Um, this could also be verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature, perhaps like, you know, giving somebody a back, back rub or um, uh, say, making suggestive comments or suggestive um, tweets or texts or whatever. Um, and it could fall into the category of something that creates a hostile environment. And this usually involves more than one instance of somebody, you know, maybe they have offensive images hanging around or they make offensive comments and it, it sort of pollutes the atmosphere of the uh, workplace or the classroom. And, and this, this has been demonstrated to interfere with people's work performance and their academic performance. And then there's the more egregious quid pro quo, which of course we all know by now means this for that, um, in which somebody is told that their academic standing, or perhaps if they're in a, a job like a student, uh, in student working in a research lab, is conditioned on submitting to the conduct. And this does not have to be explicit. It could be just sort of implied. So um, in this same study that I quoted before that was in Medical Teacher in 2006, um, there's reported results of mistreatment and harassment in medical students that it interfered with their ability to participate in a learning environment. So often they withdrew. Sometimes it was just hours and days. Sometimes it was months. Sometimes it continued to affect them for the rest of their career. Um, it increased the incident of incidents of depression and alcohol use. And, um, and we were talking about how those were kind of related to burnout as well. And, and then all the things that burnout was related to. Um, it often resulted in people avoiding, so 60% of students that had been harassed or mistreated avoided that person or avoided the whole department they were in, or even that whole specialty. Like 30% of people were like, yeah, I wouldn't have anything to do with that specialty that was represented by this person. Um, it increases student withdrawal and isolation. And um, we talked about how when students come less during the learning environment, talk about how when students come into medical school, they're less likely to be depressed than their peers. And when they leave, they're more depressed than their peers. So anything that increases their withdrawal and isolation is only gonna make that worse. And it actually results in like 10% of students quitting, 11%. And 4% and, um, of them actually having to take time off from school just on the basis of having been harassed and mistreated, that they're, they're that profoundly affected by it. So, but, you know, med medical education kind of has a history on harassment of kind of thinking it might be good for people. So that the, the uh, this study actually addressed that, like, what is it good for people? And the answer is maybe it is good for a subset of people, or they think it's good. And there might be some psychology involved in that, which we'll get into in a, in a minute or two. But so like a quarter of students did say, I, I, my motivation was increased. I don't know if that was because they felt like I better prepare or I'm going to be humiliated publicly. So I'll make sure I read this article and know it's stone cold. Um, uh, almost 30% uh, almost said they felt more assertive which I thought was interesting. Like, I, I feel like men, I, since it was only 30%, that means that 70% felt, you know, didn't feel more assertive. And I can imagine that some people would feel less assertive if they were attacked for something in on rounds or say. But I wondered about that, whether some of those people, if it might kind of paradoxically be something they end up modeling and that they might be someone who turns into a harasser of people they're underlings later. And a good 13%, small proportion, but some people said, I felt like I was a better person because I was mistreated or harassed. So I'm not sure where that's coming from, um, whether it's, um, uh, I guess 
it's a resilience thing, baby, right? Maybe they like work to prove they were better than what they were told or something. I don't know. Like, right. It's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like in our faculty book club book. We're reading. I was about to say that same thing, Caroline. <laughs> I just finished it recently. <laughs> I didn't start it yet. I need to start it. You, it's, it's very timely. Okay, I'll get right to it then. Thanks. So, um, so why is harass harassment still so pervasive in medical education? So there's this whole notion of you learn better under the gun, you know, kind of almost like a military mindset, like you're going to be, you need to be tough, you know, you're going to be under stress and you need to be able to take it. You know? So we're going to create stress for you so you can learn to be under it. So um, this article, you learn better under the gun was based, it was on a, based on a bunch of uh, interviews with Canadian surgical residents and faculty and um, talked about, you know, we're, we're all aware that the historical culture of medicine and in particular surgery um, has this uh, culture of harassing trainees and that it's, they consider, they actually like the faculty said, oh yeah, like intimidation, harassment, humiliation, those are um, teaching tools so they actually used it intentionally. It was a choice, like it was a strategy, an educational strategy that was being applied. And, and that the faculty and even the trainees that had been um, schooled by it, some of them perceived it as being an effective strategy, um, but that seemed to be conditioned upon um, if, they, if the person perceived that the motivation behind the harassment and humiliation was good, like if, if it was like, well, this is a patient safety issue, this person just freaked out on me because I did something that could have hurt a patient or um, that they were trying to drive home a point or something like that, um, or that, uh, that they th thought that they were trying to increase their motivation. Uh, I see that Leon raised his hand. Can, can Go ahead, what did you want to say? Dr. Dumas? Sorry, no, that wasn't a question. Oh, it wasn't a question, okay. Sorry. No worries. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that was kind of interesting. It, it's almost like, um, I don't know, I guess when you get really, you can identify with the culture that you're in to such an extent that you feel like, um, I and mean, these are, they clearly, they asked these residents, um, the, the residents recognized that if what happened to them in the operating room would have happened in like um, at a party or in public that they would have called the police. Like these were, some of these were really egregious incidents like hitting the person, shoving them, you know, just amazing like stuff. But they still were like, no, it was okay, you hadn't, you know, had my back. It was just interesting that, that the culture is like that. And so this harassment continues. And um, even though we have, and I have, a, I have some data, well, it's that same article, the you learn better under the gun, but it's in the dark color at the bottom, the reference for the slide. But yet we have abundant evidence um, from our educational data that adult learners learn better without when fear, frustration, and conflict are not part of their educational environment. We know that if a person is in a state of intimidation, humiliation, that activates their sympathetic nervous system and it causes a lot of activity. If you were to do a PET scan on the brain of an intimidated learner, their amygdala, amygdala will be all lit up, but their prefrontal cortex will be blank. And that's where the learning is. It's up there in the prefrontal cortex. You know, it's where the synapses are happening and it's where the, um, the, you're making these, if you're, say you're in patient care, it's your executive function. What do I do first? What do I do second? Um, what, what's the priority? What's the strategy? All that isn't happening if you have an intimidated, humiliated, stressed out trainee. None of that's happening. So um, it, another issue is that if you make, if people are being attacked for something they didn't know or a question they asked, um, sometimes faculty perceives a question as a challenge to them. 
um, and they react in a hostile way. I've certainly experienced that during my training. Um, that they stop asking questions. They start concealing their knowledge gaps because they don't want to be vulnerable because to reveal a lack of knowledge is to be vulnerable. And if you're in a culture where then you're attacked, then you're going to hide it. Um, of course, it's the culture keeps being perpetuated because um, the faculty isn't modeling. Uh, they're, they're just sort of saying, I know, every, you know, I know everything, don't challenge me kind of a thing. So where the faculty could use this as a time to promote ongoing learning. And then, and there can even be like a harassment culture, especially in like training programs where um, somebody who's, or even on a rotation with medical students where somebody who's perceived as the strong student is getting a lot of like encouragement and being kind of juxtaposed against somebody who's been picked out as the weak student. And, the, and you'll find that the, the strong, it becomes hard to identify harassment environments because the strong student is like, well, he deserved it. You know, because they like, it builds their ego up to be feeling like they're, um, they're the good one. And the other thing that's concerning is that in this really harsh environment, there's no room for empathy for each other or for your patients. And empathy um, is, of course, as we learned in the learning environment talk, is a really important part of resilience, um, about satisfaction, continuing in the profession, about your patients being satisfied, and so on. So what's the status of mistreatment and harassment at Quillen? So we've, we've looked at this data before from the uh, graduation questionnaire, but we uh, I changed the format out on the advice of Amy Johnson, who's a wonderful educator. Um, we've already looked at this data in terms of comparing it to the national average, but I've broken it down into um, the average number of students per year over the last four years that had at least one incidence of these different types of harassment. So we get a sense of in numbers. So out of our 70 students per year, 25 of them get embarrassed. Out, out of our 70 students, 13 of them are public, would say they were publicly humiliated. And one of them was threatened with physical harm. One of them was actually harmed. So every year, one student for the last four years, on average, one person has been actually harmed. Two of them were required to perform personal services, like you know, making the coffee or going and fetching something for somebody. Um, four students per year say that they were subjected to unwanted sexual advances. On every other year, about every other year, somebody says that they were asked to exchange sex for grades. Nine students per year say that they were subjected to offensive sexual sexist remarks. Three students per year were subjected to racially or ethnically offensive remarks. Two students per year were subjected to offensive remarks about sexual orientation and seven students per year were subjected to offensive remarks based on other characteristics. The people the individuals doing the, the harassment, the, the, the largest number is clinical faculty, faculty in a clinical setting. And um, the next highest is residents as the harasser. And after that, faculty in the classroom. So um, with, and then the other, the smaller numbers are like staff or nursing or something like that it's farther down. So, I mean, if you think of it that way, you know, like a lot of these numbers, one is too many, you know, one every four years would be too many. So, you know, we do have some work to do. Addie, I was thinking about that subject to racially insensitive remarks or ethnically insensitive remarks, considering we have a um, pretty white group of students. Um, if we think about the number of students, though I think it's improved a little bit in the last couple of years, that are not white, it's a pretty low number. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, it, it puts that a little bit more in context of those that might um, be spe specifically subjected to racially insensitive remarks, just thinking about that. Right. And then, you know, as we, bring in the context of what's going on in our country right now. 
And um, so that even uh, as Amy Johnson in the email she sent out, I don't think all of you got it, but not saying anything to your learners to acknowledge, especially if you have students of color in your classroom to, to say, to maybe inquire, you know, how are things going for you during this time? To, to not acknowledge that and the impact of it, of what's going on in the country for those students might be kind of offensive. You know what I mean? To not be, to just like pretend like nothing's happening. So I, I followed Amy's advice this Great week. Great point. Yeah. I actually did that in the elective that I started and had a fabulous discussion where students were very open. There happened to be a couple of um, African-American students in that class. And it was pretty amazing and pretty um, shocking, the stuff that they were, they were giving personal anecdotes about stuff that had happened to them and about the impact of them on of what's going on. And it was just stunning. And it was a really, really important conversation, I thought. So I was glad that Amy had said that. So any other comments? I don't know if you saw this, Paul um, put in the chat, he said, um, if you're not in classes right now, I think that's what he meant. Um, yeah, should we be asking like mid-July when the um, classes start back for like new first and second years? I guess it depends on what the, what the, com the conversation, the national dialogue is at that time. So, uh, Patty, I'm doing the MSPE interviews now, the Dean's Letter interviews, and I had two students of color today, neither African American, and I raised that question with both of them, how they had been Im impacted by this at the very end of the encounter. And neither of them said they had been personally impacted beyond just sort of the general distress of seeing this go on in society, but both of them also thanked me for asking about that. Thank you. That's good to know. And Paul, I guess I brought up in the chat that the same thing goes for sexual orientation. So if there's you know, something, is that what you meant, Paul? Or yes. like if there's something in the news about it? Yeah, no, the same. I mean, the issue uh, for sexual orientation uh, in that regard, because we're pretty much a homogeneous uh, class. Right. Yeah, there's a few out students every I know, class, but, but not very many. Example, yeah. On one, you can count on one hand. Yeah, mm -hmm. that are out. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's probably, there's more that as you get to know and trust people that mm -hmm. you find that you find. Yeah. We'll talk a little more about how to make people feel more comfortable in that, in that regard in, later in the talk. Any other comments? So, so we've, Quillen has made some response to this. So one of the things was, well, we, we would see these troubling things about like people being harmed and all these sexist comments and racist comments, but none of that was like, we didn't really have anybody reporting much of that to the existing grievance system. And it, we, and what it was thought, this was before my time, that perhaps the reason why would be that in such a small school, with such small classes, to report would be to identify yourself. To identify yourself would, students are incredibly sensitive to the idea that they might get a poor evaluation or that there's kind of like a link of relationships that might lead to them being not, not admitted to a residency or something. So-and-so knows so-and-so knows so-and-so, they say, yeah, don't, don't, don't hire this student here. So they're very worried about that. So they, maybe they don't report because they think they can be identified even, um, uh, or that they, you know, that they just will be identified. So an anonymous reporting system was developed and launched, I guess it was about last summer, and we'll talk more about that. So that's one response. We're doing these faculty development talks on the learning environment and mistreatment, harassment, um, uh, and then making sure that those reports of these, the year two survey and the graduation questionnaire have been discussed in meetings and distributed widely. Um, so all those things are a response, uh, but what, you know, what else can we do? Are there, are there thoughts from you guys? 
Uh, this, this is Varun from our uh, pediatric hospitalist. Um, thanks for this. Uh, I, I joined a bit late. Sorry about that. But um, I, uh, in terms of this current discussion, uh, you, you showed a lot of numbers of, of, re of reports um, by students. Are there numbers of faculty consequences, I guess, even if it's just a talking stern talking to by, by someone higher up? Do we have numbers of... Uh, of, uh, I, I don't want to use the word punishment, but I can't think of a better word right now, but punish, how many faculty members have been punished in any way, shape, or form? Um, those numbers from the graduation questionnaire don't have any like names attached. And then what we're saying is we haven't received reports. Um, I, uh, Dr. Olive, I don't know, like before, I don't know if we can say that, I can tell you that from complaints that have come through. I only know about things that have come through. I can tell you that they are followed up on and that, um, uh, let's say that. So, Patty, let me, happen. let me add. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the data Patty showed come from the graduation questionnaire and that's student, done by students at the end of medical school and the data is anonymous. So we just get the reports back after they've graduated. Okay. And the vast majority of those things reported on the graduation questionnaire have not been previously reported. So we don't know who the perpetrator was or when it happened or where it happened. It's just kind of like here's a, a monitoring of how much of it is reported going on. And we have national norms to compare with. And we're generally at or below the national norm. So it's really difficult to say I think action is the word you were looking for, Dr. Kumar. What sort of actions have occurred as a result of that? There occasionally have been things that would come up through the faculty, the course evaluation system where we'd see something. And in a case like that, it's usually discussed with the faculty member or the department chair or the course director to try and address it. Uh, since we've been having the anonymous reporting system, uh, we have had some specifically identified individuals and actions have occurred to address the problems there. Uh, we have not had enough that we could meaningfully report it happens in this percentage of cases. Is that a fair summary, Dr. Amadio? Yes, you said that very well. Thanks for yeah. getting me out of trouble. <laughs> thank you both. Yeah, and th thank you, Dr. Olive, for articulating my question better than I did. Um, <laughs> and answering I, it well. <laughs> I didn't express myself very well, but action was uh, what I was looking for. I mean, even with the current issues uh, uh, regarding race in our country, um, it's good to talk about things, it's good to have discussions, but if, if, it, if it just keeps continuing, um, We've only we've only taken a half step in a sense. So. Yeah, and I, I think. <laughs> sorry, Patty. I was going to say what it, it's a difficult situation, but I think that one of the of the. And I don't know. This is just me talking. I don't know legally or what other the kinds of things we can do. Um, you know, when there's high profile cases, if we think across the, uh, the street on the main campus, there's been a few high profile cases that were in the news and that everybody knew about. And I think it's very important to be transparent about those high profile cases about these are the specific actions that are being taken. If it's, um, you know, something that's reported through an evaluation, which is an anonymous, you know, and we have to figure out go and talk to the person, or if it's something that's um, reported anonymously through the grievance system, I, it, maybe I, just a question is how transparent should we be about actions that are taken, um, respecting both the privacy of the student and privacy of the, um, the faculty, potential faculty member concerned? And I don't know the answer to that, it's, but maybe there is some transparency that should happen, especially in a particularly egregious situation to say this was not, this was unacceptable and this was the consequence. I don't know. Right. Well, we'll get to kind of whether you have to, so you're, what you're saying, if I understand is, do people get feedback on what the response was of the, generally speaking, the person, if somebody makes a formal complaint, they will get, and if, if it falls into, we'll get into this more, but um, they will be told about the results of a, um, of whatever complaint, how it was investigated, what the results of the investigation were. Um, that's if it's investigated through the compliance office, 
But as far as whether we will tabulate and say, well, how did we address that? That I don't know. So I can give a specific example that is uh, safe to give because there are no confidentiality issues involved. This has been a few years ago. One of our medical students in the clinical phase of the curriculum came to me and reported an event that occurred in the OR with an OR tech. And the student was a female student and the OR tech was a male student. Her lab coat was laying on a chair in the side of the operating room. He went and removed her uh, ID from her lab coat held out the front of his scrub pants like he was going to drop her ID down in his shorts and said, come and get it. Yeah. And this was observed by multiple other people in the uh, OR. So when the student came and reported to me, I contacted the hospital and they acted pretty quickly uh, with respect to that. That employee was terminated from the hospital within a week or two of the event occurring after it was investigated by their HR department. And we notified the student of the outcome of that. That's, that sounds like a good, good answer. Thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna co go on. So here, here are some of my suggestions and we can talk more about further suggestions later. Um, one thing is just remember that the little things are the big things, right? Like, so little things like attitude, like our attitude toward our learners. You know, with regard especially to this humiliation thing, right? Or the, to, to respect, to, to carry like a posture and a stance of respect for our students as adult learners. Um, to be thoughtful when we're, com we're talking to students, choosing our language carefully in emails, when we give feedback, when we speak to, to students. Um, yeah, this is a hard one for me because like um, my husband, Dr. Cross, has said that uh, sarcasm is my love language, but, <laughs> but avoiding sarcasm. Sarcasm is often very badly perceived by students. It can be very dark and very cutting. So, um, so, um, so I think that it's something we should avoid. Um, greeting students, just be, being personal and saying, you know, how are you doing? How are things going? trying to remember what they choose to be called. Um, uh, I see in the chat about calling it out when we see, if, if we as a faculty member witness another faculty member harassing, mistreating, or abusing to, to stay, say something, see something, say something. And um, people agreed that if the faculty just see it, let it go, they will learn not to say anything. That's absolutely true. Um, here's one that may help with the comfort level of our students that um, are, have a different sexual orientation or that are gender nonconforming or um, uh, have a different, different gender identity um, to use inclusive language. So instead of saying boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, say, say partner you know, so that, that everybody will feel comfortable. And use place of worship instead of church. We have, you know, students of many different uh, religious backgrounds. So it's like, um, I think if, if you're part of the sort of the dominant culture and you make a lot, you make the assumption that it'll make somebody feel comfortable if you say the thing that most, that you think most people are comfortable with. But, um, these should be not offensive to anyone. So just to use those kind of terms might be helpful. When you're making examples like cases and stuff, try to draw them from diverse cultures to use names that might be of a, um, you know, from a different background. And um, if there are cultural things you want to weave into those cases, get an expert, um, advisor that's a representative of the culture you're trying to depict so that you don't inadvertently do something um, culturally offensive if that's not a culture you're yourself a part, part of, if that makes sense. And try to just keep conveying, we, we talked about in the learning environment thing, how one thing that helps students that's associated with less burnout is feeling like the faculty really cares. So expressing concern, expressing warmth, expressing optimism. Um, I got uh, on one of the, um, the verbal comments on the Doctoring Two evaluations this year, 
a student mentioned that when they were in teaching rounds with Dr. Jason Moore, that um, he noticed that the student seemed a little down in the dumps and that he made a point of after the thing, he said, hey, you know, how are you doing? You seem a little down. And the student, it, he so much valued that he did that, that he remembered it and put it in his course evaluation that how much that meant to him, he was feeling down and he was really discouraged right then and that he noticed and that he, you know, said something and meant so much to this poor student. Um, when I was doing my, the simulation training talks a lot about um, sort of a learning stance that you need to have. Um, I'm gonna get to this question in a second. Let me just finish this piece. Um, that to have a, a stance of curiosity and to have this, to con try to convey positive regard, kind of like an unconditional positive regard, to, to try to hold in your mind these beliefs about our learners, that they're intelligent, that they're capable, that they care about doing a good job and that they want to improve. And if you see something that makes you think something other than that, um, don't assume that you know the reason for it. So if you, um, say you see a, a word person says something or does something and you think it means well that person is didn't didn't prepare they're not interested maybe they're on their phone or something like that don't assume you know the reason for the action ask so that's what this test all inferences means we're very quick to run up the ladder of inferences and to say i to to think we know the reason behind the motivation behind a particular action or something someone says and but we don't unless we ask so if you don't if it's something you don't want to ask in front of the group then pull the person aside or contact them later and say you know i noticed you were on your phone a lot during our small group today um, what's going on tell me and if you create a safe environment for that then you might find out that either the person might admit that it was just they were you know ordering sneakers from Amazon or that they they but they might be like yeah I was just getting news that my mother was in the hospital you know and then um, you can go from there once you know after you've tested your inferences and you know what the actually is going on um, you 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 know how to proceed so um, and this also goes for sometimes we think we have ideas that perhaps a student is impaired and we may be right, but we may be, it may be that some of the things that people that have had a lot of trauma are doing or that are actively in a hugely stressed out situation, um, like an overwhelming stress situation, those behaviors and stuff can look a lot like behaviors of somebody that's addicted. They can be distracted. They can't track and, um, uh, re when you're really uh, under a huge amount of stress, you can't record short things in your short term memory. So it'll be like, why don't you remember that we were doing this class thing? Or why I just said that. Why didn't you not need to track this? Or the person seems really agitated. Um, so all those things can be signs of stress as well. So again, when you see something, test your inferences. Ask them, what's going on? You seem distracted in class today. You seem like you were having trouble thinking, can I help in some way? You know, like, so if you ask things in a concerned manner, you might get a good response. Um, I'm gonna come back to this again. I'm putting, I'm parking this question um, and I will come back to it. So um, then kind of creating this environment for emotional safety, friendliness, smiling, use a respectful and relaxed tone of voice, if you find yourself reacting and feeling irritated, you know, take a deep breath first. Next step is reflect. Why, what am I feeling? What am I reacting to? Why am I feeling this way? Just take a little inventory before you respond and, um, and get to so you. You're not just responding out of, you know, irritation, fatigue, your own stress. Avoid polarizing side discussions. I mean, so considering this thing that's the, all the stuff that's going on in America right now with the demonstrations and so on, um, depending on your viewpoint on those things. So 
or, and there's plenty of other controversial things, right? So countries split down the middle. Maybe our students are split down the middle. And so if you're, you sort of decide you're gonna have a little, little political chat um, it, it, online and there's students standing around, you know, your odds are that half of the students are going to maybe find what you're saying offensive. So avoid those polarizing side discussions. Avoid shaming, avoid ridicule. Don't have a mocking tone. Students are vulnerable. You know, their, their learnings, their, their skills are on display. They're feeling vulnerable and exposed. Their whole identity is at risk. So handle them carefully, be, be kind. So um, I wanna go ahead and let's see. So the question was, how do you advise students and residents to respond to mistreatment by patients? Culturally insensitive remarks are fairly commonplace, at least at the VA. Um, so that uh, is a good question. And um, I think that in fact, it makes me think that I should probably put that into, I have to give some orientation for the students, the M3s, the rising M3s, that I should probably give them advice on how to do that. And I, I, so the answer is, I'm not sure what the right answer is for that. I, I can guess what, I can make up an answer like what I would think I would tell them. But um, uh, I, I think I'm gonna include that in my training that I have to give them shortly. Does anybody else have a good answer for that one? Um, I would say you at least should debrief if you observe it with the student. Mm -hmm. if, if, if patients are making some culturally insensitive remarks and you're there and you hear it and the student and the student's there, maybe at least debrief like after mm -hmm. the like encounter or where you were and say, hey, um, the, uh, I know you just heard that it, it may, I wasn't okay with what this patient said or that, that, you know, it's not, um, appropriate. How do you, how are you feeling after seeing that? Just at least have some debrief moment, even if it's not addressing the patient specifically, but at least you can address it with the student that was a part of that. I don't know what others, that's the way I would handle it. And one thing I say to our students in the transitional course is, you know, you're going to see examples of good behavior, you're going to see examples of bad behavior, and you have to reflect on that and form what you want to do and how you want to react as a physician. Um, and maybe emphasizing that to your residents up front at the orientation, because there will not always be a faculty present, unfortunately, um, to help debrief too. Yeah, that's a great point about also talking to our residents about if our resident sees or, you know, is a part of an encounter with a, a patient who's, you know, harassing or just being insensitive for the resident to be, um, talk to the, the student about it or at least tell the supervising faculty that this happened. So then if they're not comfortable, they can talk about right. it. Right. But I feel like it's that the student would have to think about how they would respond because they should respond professionally. But I do feel like that they should be able to give some pushback. But I'm going to do a little research on that and um, uh, see. But I think that would be a good thing to include in the M3 training, don't you think, Dr. Abercrombie? Yeah. Feedback so, from students who, who have had to deal with that. Uh, one of the main things is like, is I think what you said, Patty, which is to have to anticipate it. And if you do encounter uh, somebody who really says something offensive and, and uh, to you personally, professionally, to kind of pre-decide how you want to choose to handle it. So a lot of times that anticipation, because it's still going to be hard to implement that when it actually happens. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of encourage people to make, make sure that they've anticipated it so they'll be making a choice and not a reaction. I love that advice. Thanks, Jean. I appreciate you. So here's the piece about what are the reporting pathways. What do you do if you observe mistreatment or if a student tells you about an incident of mistreatment? So um, according to ETSU policy and federal law, as a faculty member, you're a res responsible employee. That's a, a sort of a Title IX term. All staff and graduate assistants are also responsible employees. 
and responsible employees are required to report any and all instances of student harassment and or mistreatment based on protected categories. So these protected categories are um, discrimination, mistreatment, harassment that's based on race, skin color, religion or creed, ethnic or national origin, your sex, your gender, gen um, the sexual orientation, gender identity and expression piece is not yet federal law mandated reporting, but ETSU policy requires it to be reported. Um, your disability or age or status as a covered veteran is a protected category and your genetic information, which I wouldn't imagine would come up very often. So um, the easy thing to remember is just me. So if you tell me, then I can figure out what category it falls into and report it on to main campus if necessary. So I, my contact information is here. Um, and you could do that by a phone call or an email or a stop by in, in, in a world where we stop by and are with other humans. And, um, or you could use this the lovely new online reporting system. And I've got a link to the reporting system here. Uh, which is found on both the academic affairs, the faculty affairs, and the student affairs homepages. And that report, that, where that report will go is directly to me. So another uh, important contact is um, Garrison Burton in the compliance office on main campus. And um, I'm pl planning to have, uh, Heather is going to help me make little cards, like a little wallet card with all these information on it so that, you know, you would just have it handy in case something comes up. I think Dr. Schoberg had suggested that last year. So just to walk you through it's how- It's a great idea. Thank you. It was Dr. Schoberg's idea. He always has good ideas. So um, he's on the beach now. I see his palm tree today. But um, so to walk you through the reporting, so if just taking the academic affairs homepage, if you look on that left menu thing towards the bottom, report a concern or complaint. If you click on that, you'll see a screen a lot like this tells you the reason for this uh, system. And we've actually changed the wording so it no longer says student concern system because there was a, I forget what the survey was, but a faculty survey that showed that female faculty were reporting hearing a lot of kind of gender related mistreatment kind of comments. And so that if a faculty member wants to report, they could use this system as well about something that happens to them. So it's not just for to report things that happen to students, could be a grad student or a faculty member as well or staff person. So when you next see the screen, it will say um, uh, you get to choose whether you want to remain anonymous or you want to provide identifying information. So you just click on one of these boxes and then hit next page. And then the next thing, if you chose the do not the anonymous path, you wouldn't see any place to insert your identifiers. You would choose which category. I have been mistreated. I've witnessed mistreatment. I've, I'm not associated with the incident, but I've heard about it. I heard about it. And I want to report it. Or even I'm not sure if it was mistreatment, but I, I want to report it. The next page, you get a little text box in which you should describe the, de the, the um, incident in as much detail as you wish. And, um, and then you can categorize it. And these are the same categories that relate to that graduation questionnaire, whether you're just humiliated and chastised, neglected, left out of communications, subjected to sexist remarks, mistreatment based on sex or gender, subjected to ethnically or religiously offensive remarks, um, uh, vulgar language, object of religiously, or uh, that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure. I never noticed that those two were there. Uh, subjected to vulgar languages, made, made to do personal services, sexual mistreatment, physical harm, threat, or subjected to. So then there's a, then you would. Dr. Mario, can I ask a question briefly? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to that survey, when they're asking the questions about whether they've had those, the students have had, ever had those experiences, is it from anybody or is it just from like uh, faculty, staff, or does it also include peers? It includes peers and there is a small proportion that are other students, that is correct. Okay. Yes, 
but and it's it casts a wide like the question is has this ever happened and then in a later question they have the opportunity to say who was responsible for the whatever happened so anyway after you finished doing all that you hit submit okay so if you if the, you or a student uses this anonymous reporting system it cannot be tracked like not even the ip address is the same red cap system that goes through that's used for like you know random data in a study or something like that it, it only will have as much identifying information as the person who made the report chose to include like if they mentioned people's names or dates that's all we would have to go on um and remember that now because the duties of this responsible employee thing so say a student comes to you with a complaint of um, being sexually mistreated okay so and you you if you become aware of that you must report it whether to me or to through this system you can't use anonymous reporting for that you must tell you who you are you must tell all you know in detail you must give names date locations and times to the extent that you know them everybody involved contact information if you've got it so if you're actually reporting you can't use anonymous for that so with this group you um, you might re recommend a student to use the anonymous reporting system if they decide not to tell you about it um, in detail because they they don't want the exposure you can say you know you could use this anonymous system tell as much as you can without outing yourself and um, you can uh, even say do it later after you graduate tell us you know just so we have something so, but you could use the this anonymous system to report something that happened to you. If you want. So, Dr. Monica brought up literally what I was waiting uh, to say. I think we're we're on the same wavelength, Paul. Um, all, don't you also have the responsibility for when a student comes to you to tell you something to say, stop them and say, "I am a, a responsible employee, and I'm I may have to report this, so that they can make the decision to continue." Um, or not yes and you'll remember that that was in the training yeah uh, before the best time I, it's, I think it's the next slide okay uh maybe it's the slide after this well no it's after that one but okay yes the next maybe i need to reorganize my talk but yes so the best time to tell a student about the required reporting is before they tell you yeah <laughs> student comes to tell you comes to you and they say i have to tell you something that happened say let me just say that if it's something that involves one of these protective categories like a racial slur or sexual, sexual harassment. harassment yeah i'm gonna have to report it i'm required by law to do that is that okay and then they'll probably ask you for more information and then if you don't know the answer you could ask tell them to talk to me but if you do you but hopefully you will know the answer and the answer is you know i would have to tell tell the grievance officer and it would have to go to main campus they will respect your anonymity as much as possible and the only time if you wish to remain anonymous they will also be guided by they don't want to re-traumatize people on main campus so they will be guided by if the person says um i i want to remain anonymous but i want somebody to know about this and i would like my i like i'd like to be switched out so i don't have to be in a small group with this person anymore right then main campus would say okay we can make that happen right so or maybe they're on a, a job or something so okay we can switch you out of that job so um so that could happen kind of confidentially right the only times that it may be that even if the student wants to remain anonymous would be if it's something criminal the criminal complaint or if it's something that it's say it's such an egregious case of faculty harassing a student that the faculty might be terminated mm -hmm. so then and they're like having to be detenured or something then the student might be asked to um, give a statement and of course they are protected against retaliation in those but as we've all seen unfold on the news that you know it's not always possible to protect people from all retaliation but to the best of our ability they would be protected 
from retaliation. Does that answer everybody's questions? So, um, so this is sort of a little study of what we were just talking about. So even but the take home point of this slide is that the student might say, well, what's the point of doing it anonymously? Well, we can get some information, right? At least if a person is, we can sort of assess the credibility of the anonymous report. We can say, hmm, this person reported this about this faculty member or this grad student. Then we get another report a month later, same thing. Another report, same thing. We start getting to triangulate these things and we, we have enough data then to go to that person and be like, you know, what's going on and to have some kind of uh, accountability happen. But we are not, like, we're taking this really seriously. I'm, I'm very serious about this. Um, so, and Dr. Block is very serious about this. I think we all want this to be, really want it to be a good learning environment. So if you wanted to choose the named choice, I choose to provide identifying information, you would hit, you would choose that box, hit the next page, and you just get a block box to put in your name, email, your preferred method of contact, and then a box will open up for putting in your contact information. And then the same things, what did, were you mistreated or you heard about mistreatment? Um, the little text box to describe it in as much detail as you can, and then to categorize it in one of these accounts. Uh, okay, so Dr. Schoberg is suggesting that I should use that anonymous reporting slide. Okay, that's a good idea. Anyway, then you just hit submit. So. Here's that slide I was telling you about. The best time to make the student aware of required reporting is before they disclose details. If the student does not want this reporting to happen, then you should say, you should have confidential counseling. So if they come, somebody had put in the chat, can they come to, you, to me and talk confidentially? No, I'm a responsible employee. But they could go to Phil Steffi you know, and he's, he would, he's allowed to keep completely confidential what is disclosed to him in a counseling setting. So if the student did not prefer to have a male counselor, he can also refer to a female counselor. We don't have a female counselor on the staff, but we have a referral pattern set up for that. So if they want to have it be completely confidential and they can just vent and tell about what happened, then they would, could go to a clergy person or to a counselor. So we're also required to report for our, those that we direct supervise, directly supervise our staff and such. Is, can we give them over to the EAP counseling program and that would be you mean confidential, it's, correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. And there's, through that, are, it, the and grad students and stuff too, like there's, um, they have, over on main campus in the psychology services, there's so many appointments they can have per year. So they, they will do counseling over there for people. Um, for I wonder if that would include residents. I don't think residents are lined up to go to Phil Steffi either. Cause that, the, Dr. Vermeer asked who residents could go to, I believe. I think that's- uh, the, They actually can see Phil Steffi. Oh good, I didn't know that. I'll put Phil Steffi's information on the card too. Um, it's going to be have to be like one of these long, like fold out cards at this. <laughs> <time>. <laughs> okay. So, and then, but do also recommend that the student makes a complaint. All the grievances come to me. Um, so like if you report through that online system, I get a little notice in my email, email that says somebody reported something and, um, and then I handle it from there. If, it, if it's a complaint of harassment or mistreatment that isn't in one of those protected categories, um, it will be handled here. Or we have a well-defined um, process for how to do that that's outlined in a policy uh, that is posted somewhere in, on our website. And um, kind of talking about trying to resolve the situation, preserving relationships and restoring relationships where possible. But, um, but it's not going to just be glossed over. 
And um, so, and we will try to make a meaningful um, and fair process to um, address complaints of all kinds. And there may even be, even if there is an investigation on main campus, that doesn't preclude us also doing our main, our investigation. Because some things, you know, because of our professionalism, we have very high standards, you know? So like something that maybe it's, maybe they handled it, but they, not much came of that. If we think it's a professionalism issue, we might handle it more, you know? So we're, we're gonna track it as well and make sure, follow up on the resolution of it. If Main Campus does an investigation, they, um, they investigate it and they notify the complainant at the time they start the investigation, when it wraps, when the report is ready and they get a copy of the report and they rep, rep, respect confidentiality as, unless there's some kind of cr criminal thing usually or it comes to like removing somebody from work. So um, and then I, in, I've got the contact information here. Um, again, if it, even if it's mis any kind of mistreatment, please report it to me. It all affects our learning environment. If it's somebody other than a student being mistreated, like a, a staff member or something, please report it um, because it all affects the learning environment. If people are being treated badly, it all, it all creates the atmosphere and the culture of our, our, our organization. So I wanna know about it. Okay. So let me look in the chat to see what I was missing. I'm, like I said, I have trouble multitasking. But this is um, a really beautiful place in England that I had the good fortune to go to. It was one of the best days of my life that day. It was so lovely. Near Beatrix Potter's house in the Lake District. Aw. Yeah, um, with my dear Emily. It was a lovely day, lovely day. Patty, uh, do you mind if I make a suggestion? No, I'd love you to make him a suggestion. Um, well, I, first I'll tell you a little bit of a, of a story to go along with it. Um, when I was a graduate student, when I was a PhD student, um, I, it, was, it was basically five years plus of a fraternity hazing. It was very much like that. Hmm. And when I talked to my colleagues, and this would be well over 100 colleagues, of people who have graduated from biomedical science PhD programs that are kind of in my age range, maybe from 15 years older than me, 15, 20 years younger than me, which is a pretty good expanse since I'm about 55. I would say a good 80 or 90% of them report the same kind of experience in, in graduate school. Um, there's two problems with it. One is people, as you pointed out, people learn to treat students the way they were treated. And then there's also part of this process, at least as I experienced it, was basically set the students who were having difficulty against the students who were doing better. It's a triangulation. And so if you, were, if you were doing well, you received, if it was known that you were doing well, you actually received an enormous amount of flack from other students. Oh, hmm. I mean, I had to file a complaint against a faculty member in graduate school who was disclosing my grades to other students, and I was receiving harassment from those other students. Hmm. So, and 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 so, being in that kind of what I would kind of characterize as a toxic, toxically competitive environment, really contributes to burnout. And we know about physician burnout. You know, there's a lot of stuff at the AAMC or some stuff at the AAMC meeting about basic scientist burnout. And when you're burnt out, even if you try to do the right thing, it's harder because you're just reactive and tired. And, you know, so you don't think about maybe saying things to people in the kindest possible way or the most sensitive possible way that you can. Uh, like when you're correcting someone or something like that. And so it can leave other people feeling harassed or humiliated or something like that. So my, my suggestion was going to be, uh, when I look on the participants list, of course, because this is about medical student mistreatment, 
most of the people that I think attended were people that teach medical students. But we've got quite a few research faculty who maybe only teach uh, medical students a little bit, but who teach graduate students a lot, who probably need to hear this same thing because I think of many of them like me were probably came from environments, uh, learning environments that were not particularly supportive. And, and so I think it would be good maybe to remind, to do this thing, this, this seminar again, but maybe target it to, you know, the graduate program kind of thing. And maybe also with graduate students to make sure that they are aware of the processes for reporting mistreatment and harassment uh, and things like that. Not saying this is happening in our program, but, you know, when I first think about it, I mean, it sort of amazes me that our medical students still get prid quo pro and you know sexually harassed and vile comments made about their ethnicity and race and things like that i mean that just amazes me that that happens so you know i would guess that it probably also happens in the graduate program as well so right. a lot of the graduate programs it's really a setup for keeping quiet because the students are from they're on like student B, the J-1 visas and stuff. So if they lose their job, they have to leave the country. They have no, they really don't have a lot of protections, I don't think. There's quite a lot of room for that. And I, I would say in graduate programs, it's even smaller groups of students because in a graduate program, like a doctoral program, you're, um, you know the very few other students very well. <laughs> and so it, it's really hard to be anonymous. <laughs> right. To report at all, even using an anonymous report, is to out yourself. Yeah. Everybody knows who it was, who, how it happened, who was there, et cetera. There's like two people in the lab and you're one of them. You know, everybody right. knows what happened. So it, this is I, something I, it is on my radar and I think that's a great idea. And I will talk to Dr. Wordway about it because um, we we talked earlier this year, Dr. Olive and I, about whether whether I was just going to be helping the medical students because stuff had already come up from some of these other pathways. One one complaint from somebody who worked here, and um, one from a, through the graduate school program. And medical students are in that program too, so it's they they are in those research labs. You know, those are all great comments. Patty, I had a question about the student mistreatment by patients. Okay. Uh, it sounds like in a lot of cases, there may not be a real practical outcome that can happen, or maybe it's not a report situation. But in that case, are you still, like, could the student still come talk to you to kind of just process what happened? And yeah, absolutely. I would love that. Or uh, Jean or Phil, Steffi, I would say. Okay, good. Well, I would add that an action we can always take is to remove the student from that situation. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Thank you. Right. But if it's like a patient you just saw, you might not see them again anyway, I guess. I love, thank you so much for bringing up um, um, the, the issue about patient harassing students. Because I really do feel that that would be worth um, that is a big category of sources of harassment on the graduation questionnaire and that it would be good, like Dr. Daniel said, to have, um, have them think about what, what they would say and to give them ideas on what would be a good thing. And thanks, um, uh, Ivy, for putting that link. I already linked it. So I can have a look at it later because I'm in the process of finishing up my slides for the, the medical students and making cases. So I'll make a case of a, a medical student. We, we're going to do case discussions this year. So don't you think, uh, Dr. Abercrombie, that would be a good idea? Have one be a patient harassing a student? Yeah? You like that? I was actually just thinking, I wonder if she's going to make a new case out of this. You know I am. Okay. All right. And, you know, I will say as a new young faculty, I feel myself in some awkward situations, not knowing how to respond to some situations with other faculty, students even. Mm. Um, so, and I wasn't aware that faculty could anonymously report through this system for their, in, 
through their own offenses that were happened to them. And I think as a new faculty, you know, you're often a little, fr I was the only young female here back then in that day practically. And so a first year, you know, reporting that a first year had done something, it would have probably been pretty obvious regardless. But um, I think it's, I mean, if we could get this, you know, I know we do our training, but I don't know that how to report is very clear in that training, especially through this anonymous system. So if we had something for new faculty like this, I think this would be really great too. Mia yeah, is part of the onboarding, this training. Okay. Yeah, I think. From what Caroline was just saying, and this might be germane to new faculty, but I would suspect it might be for some of the older faculty too. What if it goes the other way around that a faculty member is feeling abused by a student who might have a particularly strong point of view? Hmm. You don't have a I went to my direct supervisor and he handled it very well and helped me through it. <laughs> I will say that. Thank you, Dr. Olive. It might so be a professionalism report kind of a thing. Yeah, we, we don't have a policy have that directly. Yeah, that's what I would do now. We don't have a policy that directly pertains to that, but you could do a professionalism report. That'd be one easy way to do it, or you could bring it to Dr. Quasigro or I. I had an issue where um, I it, it it felt like harassment to me. I mean, it wasn't really a personal thing. It was like. It's, but but I, I I filed a professionalism report and um, it was resolved. I felt like I um, was able to get through to the student involved what my concerns were about it and um, we still have a good relationship. <laughs> so. I have a, a, a sideline question. How long has it been mandated that you have to report uh you know uh filter these reports over to main campus because is that not a relatively new situation because it used to be you could do anonymous reports but then it became the mandated for us as like you said representative employees um that's kind of new is it not i don't know i think it's a couple of years what is the answer dr olive do you know it's relatively new. A couple of years is probably right. I don't know the exact time frame. Dr. Lura is here. She would probably remember. <laughs> I guess I'm, I think at the time I, I vaguely remember that there was concern that this would actually um, inhibit people from reporting if they knew it had to be because there isn't a lot of, it's still not very, I think, uh, clear about w w once it's over there, once it's out of their power and control, what's going to happen with it. And so I think it does inhibit um, people reporting. So it's just, I, I was wondering when it's, you were talking about what happens, there is information and they're gonna try to respect confidentiality. But I think from my experience with students, those are the things that keep them from reporting actually. It's the try and the unknown about what will happen and the, last, the lack of control over what happens to the information once it's reported. Right, I think, I think that is a, I think it does deter reporting to some extent, but I, hopefully having the anonymous system would at least allow, you know, students might be encouraged to, re, to use that. Um, I, doctor, when I started being the grievance officer, Dr. McGowan gave me a couple articles on kind of going against that mandatory reporting, like data that suggested that you might indeed squelch people actually disclosing things that happened that you would want to know about because of that required reporting thing. But, um, so, but I don't know, I don't know how to, how to change that policy. So, but it is a concern. And even if you tell last year, I gave the M ones a talk on the grievance process at a lunch and learn. And this one student said, <laughs> after I finished giving my spiel about how they'd be protected from retaliation and stuff, she said, I really, I don't feel safe at all from what you said. <laughs> it's like, maybe a delivery should change. I don't know. But she said, she said, I don't feel like I could, that I feel like if I told enough to, for anything to be done, because if I say what, say it's a comment that was made, if I say the comment, the harasser would probably remember what the comment was and to whom they made it. So even if I don't say who I am, 
they will still know and they could still retaliate. You know, it's like, well, it's hard to argue with that logic. And actually another dynamic I don't think we've talked about as much that keeps people from reporting is also they don't want to, I don't want it to be my fault that so gets somebody in trouble or feeling like they bear the total responsibility for somebody losing their job or their position or their ability to continue their medical education. Yeah, but the, the biggest thing I've seen so far is just that students are terribly, terribly afraid about it affecting their progression and their achievement of like getting matching to a residency. So not to make things worse, but there's some things that have happened that made things worse <laughs> recently um, because the new Title IX guidelines say that there is a, um, for sexual harassment, that um, it will allow cross-examination of, of accusers in campus oh, sexual Oh, you're right. Cases. I forgot about that, Ivy. Yeah. That would and, be uh, of a deterrent. Yeah. And so it says uh, they do have a right to a hearing, which was never formally, like, that this is a, that's a good thing to, that there is a right to a hearing um, but there's also a right for um, the accuser to be cross-examined although not by directly by the the other the person they're being they're accused but it, they they're even I think there's things in there like they can be in separate rooms that, like you can keep them apart the whole time but whoever's representing the other person has the right to cross-examine and so totally re-traumatizing right yeah yeah. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. That That's very recent, I think. Yeah, um, it is recent. It's like in the last month or something. Yeah. There's just been so much in the last month. <laughs> that's been a lot. A lot. Um, you know, I think the, I was seeing the, um, the question earlier about, you know, um, to, the academic environment differs from, from the clinical environment and what we, can we do to prepare residents to handle ongoing racism? Etc. Um, and some of the recognize it. <laughs> um, there's some of the things that were in that AAMC article that I posted. That was it was although it was specific to patient or I mean to students. I think some of those things um, still apply for residents as well. And now I'm trying to find where I put that. So it has. Um, <clears throat> You know, they, there's different acronyms that people use, um, but there's one that's like erase mistreatment, and it's like expect expect that it's going to happen, and uh, you know, <sighs> prepare your resident, <laughs> uh, recognize. Um, so check in with yourself. Pay attention to how patients treat your colleagues. Does the encounter feel innocent? Does it patient seem to be making an attempt at small talk? Does it feel icky? So just recognize that it's happening. And then address it. Um, it says come up with a script so you're able to address the mistreatment when it happens. So something as simple as your comments are making me uncomfortable. I feel offended by that can go a long way toward curbing harassment. Um, and then support. Check in. And when you see misbehavior like that was challenging. How are you feeling? I saw what happened back there. Are you okay? That's kind of what I was talking about earlier. Just at least have that debriefing moment. And then um, e, the last E is establish or encourage. Approach your institutions about developing a workshop, training modules, or if there's official reporting systems, that kind of thing. But the, the problem is, is if the... Um, I think direct confrontation is appropriate. To, it is a in most, in some instances to say um, that this is, I'm uncomfortable with, with saying that to a patient. I'll let other people's, other people see what they think about directly responding to a patient who's making you, a student or a resident uncomfortable. Um, I think, I think it's, a, I don't think that students should have to be subjected to that by anybody. And I think that there's professional ways of handling it. And I think I really think that it would be acceptable for the student to to step out. I, I don't know, but I'm going to look into what is recommended. And I really do think this would be a good thing to equip students with um, as they go into, especially the clinical years. And um, uh, so um, I really think it's an important thing that I had, had admitted from the talk I was getting ready for them. 
Um, you know, one of the other articles that I, I saw about this specifically um, from an, was talking about the addressing, and I, I don't think that students should be expected to, to confront a patient directly or to say something, but I don't think that they should be prevented necessarily mm -hmm. from it. Um, so I think the, I'm going to stick this link in the article real, or in the chat real quick if you don't have to leave. Um, so one of the things is saying, um, it says form a culture that allows caregivers to discuss incidents with patients directly. Something like our, our duties to serve all patients, no matter what sort of people they are, but this does not mean that we need to accept or ignore abuse um, is one of the, the comments here. So. And so one thing I think about is um, students or residents may not know when they're basically allowed to leave the situation. Like what is appropriate? Like if a patient says something racist to them, are they allowed to say, I'm sorry, I need to stop here. Let me go get someone else to, for your care. And they just, they don't have the experience and they don't have the people in authority telling them, yes, this is okay to walk away. So maybe we need to be more explicit about that. But I think there's also the point of when they become physicians and when they are in residency, it changes. Eventually they won't be students anymore. And so also equipping them with how you will handle this once you are in practice, I think is important. I agree. I think it's twofold, like helping them plan for how to deal with it and like acknowledging all the different ways that situation might come up. Yeah. Maybe just like having those prepared kind of scripts that we were talking about earlier. Um, for if to fall back on yeah well we probably better wrap up but it was been a lively conversation and i appreciated all your input and got lots of good ideas um and so i really appreciate everybody's um all the things you said and all the ideas you brought up and the suggestions and i may follow up with some of you for more for more detail on uh, ideas about designing the cards and stuff like that. So Heather's gonna make those and we'll distribute them in everybody's boxes. Um, and if anybody that wouldn't be having a box, we'd be distributing it in once one, just let me know and we can send it to you through, uh, you know, campus mail or something like that. Thank you so much, Patty. You're welcome. It was my, thanks so much for making the talk so much richer by all the things that you said and added i appreciate that sorry i sometimes have a problem with keeping my mouth shut i <laughs> just can't help it <laughs> hopefully it was helpful okay. um thanks everyone have a good evening okay. bye bye everybody have a good dinner take care stay well see you gene bye <laughs> all right i'm signing out i guess do, do i have to do anything